Welcome to the Path to Follow podcast. This is episode number 29. I am here with Ryan Ruff Smith, and I'm very excited for our conversation. Uh, thank you, everyone, for tuning in to the podcast. Um, I appreciate, we appreciate, Cesare and I appreciate you tuning in and watching. And, and if you're interested in more episodes, just hit the red subscribe button to the YouTube page. Check us out on Spotify, um, Apple I, Apple Music or Apple Podcasts, um, Twitter, Instagram, all the social media channels. And we have more coming your way. So thanks for watching. Thank you, Cesare, for all your work. And this is episode number 29 with Ryan Ruff Smith. Ryan, great to have you on the podcast. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. What um, I, I will say, Ryan, I, I read The Disturbance, one of your short stories, and I loved it. I thought it was amazing. I read that um, in advance to recording here. So maybe we can start out talking about yourself, what you do here, and get into that story, the disturbance. That sounds great. Yeah. Awesome. So, yeah, so what what do you do at Gilman? Who who are you? What do you do? What brought you here? Yeah. So I'm the Tickner Writing Fellow. Um, so that's a position where uh, basically Gilman brings a writer in residence onto campus to uh, teach one class, a senior creative writing elective that meets every other day. And then on my off days, I'm at home working on my own writing projects, right? And so there's a new Tickner Fellow every couple of years. Um, we're doing a search for the next fellow right now. Um, there have been some amazing writers here before me. Um, so yeah, it's just really a chance to be part of the community, but also get a lot of writing done over the course of a couple of years. When did you start writing? What, what led you to a profession in writing? Yeah, I mean... So the long answer to that question is like, I've always been interested in reading and writing, you know, since I was a little kid, I was, you know, making books with crayons and that sort of thing. Um, I started getting more serious about it uh, shortly after college. It was in college that I took my first creative writing class. It was really exciting. That was really fun for me, but I was, I was still pretty new to it. Um, and then after graduating and working for a couple of years, uh, I was living in Minneapolis at the time. Um, I was living with some friends that I was playing in a band with. So I was, you know, focusing on that a lot. Um, but I, I just started reading more and more. I started getting more into it. And there's this great uh, literary center in the Twin Cities called the Loft Literary mm -hmm. Center, which is you know just kind of a community, like adult education space, where you can go sign up for workshops. They're really inexpensive. Um, and you know have someone teach you the basics of short story writing and exchange stories with a lot of other people. And uh, it was a really interesting like uh, range of people. There were people my age, you know, in their 20s, just out of college. There were people who were just retiring and wanting to get into writing. So you know, people, uh, you know, kind of from all backgrounds, different ages, um, coming to writing short stories. If not for the very first time, you know, we, we were all still pretty new to it. Um, and so that's when I started, you know, kind of really trying seriously to improve what I was doing. Um, it's when I, where I started to learn how to revise and how important it was to write multiple drafts of a story to you know make it as interesting as it could be, and um, the more I got into that, you know, that encouraged me to apply for some MFA programs. Um, and so about six years out of undergrad, when I was I want to say 27, I started at the University of Florida, and that's where I really decided to to make writing my primary focus, the main thing I was going to devote my time to. So when you're in Minneapolis. Writing is such a process. It takes so much time, dedication, and really the environment has to be right for you to be able to focus. How were you able to kind of devote so much time to this craft that you weren't really sure that you wanted to pursue or not, if, I, if I'm hearing you correctly? How did you um, find that time, that energy, that motivation to write? That's a great question. So yeah, and it's it's definitely not easy. Um, I, you know, so I started out by just kind of making time in between things, working on stuff in the evenings and the afternoons. Uh, as I started to get more and more serious about it, I actually ended up stepping away from my day job. I worked there full time for a couple of years, and as it worked out, I was able to continue working with them. Um, you know, as a as a kind of freelance contractor, um, but so that I didn't have a set nine to five, and that really opened up my schedule. Um, I did a lot of writing then that. Uh, I haven't kept that, you know, hasn't gone anywhere, but I think was really important as, as practice and as kind of training for me to, you know, sit down every morning and, you know, try to get 500 words down, try to get a thousand words down. Uh, I was working on a novel that I never finished. Um, but again, I think it was a really important sort of uh, training process to just try making that primary and see what that felt like. So writing for you is more like disciplinary. Like you have to set aside that time to actually do it. And it's not, for me, when I've when I've tried to write, it's like I have to be in a certain mood. It has to be a certain time of day, either the morning 
really the best times for me are early in the morning, like when I just get up yep. or right before I'm about to go to bed, even kind of when I'm lying in bed, it's like ideas start to hit you. Mm -hmm. But for you, it sounds like you were setting aside certain times where you have to write. I was. And, you know, honestly, sometimes that works for me and sometimes it doesn't. Um, I had a teacher at, at Florida, uh, Mary Robeson, who's a, a great writer that I really admire, who was saying she thinks there are two kinds of writers. There are writers who sit down every day and do their work, no matter what, whether they're inspired or not. You know, they've got a set time. They sit down, they do their 500 words, they get it done. And then there are writers who spend a lot of time just kind of dreamily, you know, thinking about a book project and, and uh, working on it in their head for, a you know, a long span of time. And then sitting down over the course of a few months and pounding it out. And I think I'm, I'm, I'm kind of somewhere in between. You mm -hmm. know, I, I try to be disciplined. I, I do try to show up, you know, on, on my writing days and do it. But it, it doesn't always go well. You know, I'm, I'm not always inspired. And I think when a project is really going well, though, is when I start to build some momentum where, uh, l like you described, like first thing, you know, before I'm getting into email or, you know, taking care of any other little tasks I have to do for that day. I'm getting some writing done so that, you know, that's a good way to ensure it happens. When your head's clear in the morning. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. then um, if if I can string together a few days like that, then I start to carry the, you know, the story or the, the novel around with me. I start to have these ideas that I'm thinking about as I'm falling asleep, like, I, you know, like I was last night, you know. And so um, then then I think you're really getting to a space where you're starting to kind of like live with the project. And uh, I think that's that's where I'm always trying to be, but I, I don't think I can be there 365 days a year, you know? Right. It's almost like once that seed is planted in your head that you have an idea for a story, you kind of see the ideas everywhere in your waking life and, and take those as a sort of motivation back to your computer or to your notebook or wherever it is that you're writing the story. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you kind of you kind of need to get deep enough into it that it's something you start thinking about even when you don't mean to, that you kind of start to obsess about it. And, you know, it's one of the things that your mind goes to when it's, you know, whether you're out for a walk or you're lying in bed trying to fall asleep, whenever your mind's kind of idle, if, if it's one of the things it starts landing on, then I think, you know, you're in a good place. So the disturbance, as I said at the beginning and as I said on the way over here, that I just read that recently. I really enjoyed it. It gave me a lot to think about. Um, when did you write that story and what all went into the process of writing the disturbance? Because that's probably the, the story you're most well known for, right? I mean, in, in some of your descriptions online, it's like the disturbance really um, kind of elevated your your craft. It was published in a few journals and, and um, literary magazines. So uh, maybe we can start with the disturbance. Yeah, yeah, sure. So yeah, that story, it came out in a journal called Plowshares, which is, is pretty well regarded. I felt really lucky to have it in there. Um, and then it ended up every year, there's a, a, a anthology of short stories called the best American short stories of, of that year. Um, and, you know, there are maybe 15 stories in the anthology, but then at the back of the book, there's this list of other distinguished stories, which were basically the stories that they read in journals and considered for the anthology. Uh, and so it was listed there. I think that's why that, you know, ends up having a lot of, of uh, Google hits, that, mm -hmm. that particular story. Um, that was an interesting one for me. I th so that was the very first story that I had accepted for publication. Um, and that happened about three years after I wrote a first draft of it. So I sat down and tried to write that story for the first time in Minneapolis before I started the MFA program based on a really weird thing that happened to me. I woke up one night and um, my, my bedroom in this, this house we shared in uptown Minneapolis was at the very back of the house. It was like a converted Model T garage. It was very cold. This was in Minnesota. Like mm -hmm. I had a baseboard heater. It was, it was a ridiculous place to live. Um, but so the back door to my house was just right outside my bedroom window. And one night I heard someone trying to get in, and at first I thought it was someone trying to break into the house. Um, and later I realized there was a person in, in some distress. I was able to see through the window that, that it was this woman. Um, I'm, I'm not sure exactly what she was going through, some sort of, I don't know, some sort of psychological episode or something. Um, but then the next morning we found this pair of jeans outside the door, and there was something just really kind of haunting and, and strange about that. It was so weird. And it was one of the few moments in my life where I felt like a story had just happened to me um, just because of how strange this experience was. Um, and so I tried to write the story, um, and uh, I ended up going through probably 20 different drafts of that story. I've still got them all in a, in a Dropbox folder. They're, they're not all completely different, but the, the final version that it ended up in Plowshares, you know, shares maybe not a single sentence with the very first version. It was a story that I had to keep trying over and over. And I think part of what I realized was that in, in the real life story, in what happened, I was just a, a bystander. I was an observer to this strange event. Um, which doesn't really put me in the story. It didn't make me part of the story. 
And so what ultimately made the story work for me was when I realized that if the, the narrator of the story, the person who kind of observes this event, if he, if he in some way becomes kind of fascinated with it and becomes in this kind of uh, strange and kind of, in, in my view, you know, pretty creepy way, kind of involved in this event, he mm -hmm. becomes kind of obsessed with it, then it's not just something that happens to him, but it's something that, um, that has some sort of effect in his life and something that he's in some kind of obscure way still, but in, in a significant way participating in, right? So mm -hmm. the, um, in, in the final version of the story, you know, the creepiness is coming from inside the house, you know, like in a horror movie. Um, it's, it's something that actually has to do with him um, and his psychology, you know, in, in a way that, it, you know, in real life, uh, of course, it didn't for me. Yeah, that was probably what I found most intriguing about the story was the psychological aspect. And I told you on the way over here that I don't know why, but the, the psychology of reading and, and characters is always something that has attracted me. I always want to know why this this narrator is acting the way he does. And there's mm -hmm. You, you, in that story, you give a lot of reason to wonder, why does he do this? Why does he go on these late night walks? Why does he have this fascination with the homeless woman? Mm -hmm. um, and it, it just seemed to give me a lot to think about when I read that. Um, it is also interesting how you started this story from something that happened to you in real life. And, and I'm curious, is that always the case for you? Is there always something that has to happen in your life for you to get an idea? Or is it is it written based off your imagination at some times too? I would say that both things happen. I, I think there's probably not a story I've written that has like absolutely literally zero, you know, connection to my real life or to, you know, my experiences in some way. Um, but some of them are, you know, much more imagined than others. Some of the characters are a lot more different than me, um, than others. Um, but yeah, there usually is some some spark, right? Whether it's something that you uh, can imagine happening or something that does happen to you. I think, honestly, one of the tricky things about that story, the disturbance, was what happened to me in real life was so surprising and so strange. It seemed like a story already. Um, and so I didn't quite realize the degree to which I would have to change it to make it work as a literary short story instead of just this kind of anecdote about this crazy thing that happened to me, right? So I think real life material can be kind of... Um, Kind of tricky in that way that uh, it it may seem like you've been just you know gifted this story like fell on your lap almost. exactly yeah um, but sometimes um, that makes it harder to see the ways in which it could change right and I think that uh, I talked a little bit earlier about how important revision has been to my kind of growth as a writer and that ability to be able to see other ways it could have gone um, the ability to be able to kind of you know change things. Um, and imagine them a different way, I think is so crucial to the work of fiction writing specifically. You know, um, I'm also really interested in literary nonfiction and, and that, that has a totally different set of parameters. But I think if you're trying to write it as fiction, um, there's a risk in getting too attached to quote unquote what really happened. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what was, so in all of your revisions and writing that story and all the time, you said you wrote it over the course of three years mm -hmm. and, and almost 20 revisions. Mm -hmm. What was the most difficult part of that was it trying to figure out the the way that the story plays out after that initial incident happened which happened to you which probably wasn't the the most difficult part to write it was what played out after that was what you were mostly revising yeah and i think it just took me a long time to accept that maybe the most interesting version of this story is one in which the narrator isn't so sympathetic a character you know mm -hmm. i think part of it was that i was attached to what really happened um, but I think that also just wasn't a possibility that revealed itself to me until I'd gotten some feedback on earlier drafts where there was, you know, I th that, that story has kind of, as you were describing, like a lot of gaps in it, a lot that you kind of have to think about and try to figure out why is he behaving this way? Why is he reacting this way? Um, and that was a, a feature of the story early on. Um, and in some of the feedback that I got when I submitted that to workshops, you know, people kept saying, wow, there's something like, there's something kind of creepy about this narrator, but I can't put my finger on it. And instead of uh, trying to fix that, instead of kind of um, trying to run away from that, finally I decided to lean into it. Like, if, well, if that's what the material is suggesting, then maybe that's where the story is. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, yeah, it raised a lot of questions for me in my reading of, of that story. But um, what, what else do you write that you kind of use your experiences in reality to 
begin or initiate your story? Like how, how does that process play out for you in, in some of your other works? Yeah, I mean, so I think the clearest e- example of me writing something directly from life um, was something I originally considered to be a short story. It ended up being uh, published in a journal called Subtropics as a piece of memoir or, or nonfiction. And that now I'm thinking about including in a, the story collection I'm putting together as, you know, a, a sort of auto-fictional short story, which is a, a combination of autobiography and fiction where you're, you know, you are writing something that's essentially memoir, but, but lightly fictionalized. Um, but that, that was another, you know, kind of crazy thing that happened to me. Uh, when I first moved to Cincinnati, where I went for my, um, my PhD in creative writing, um, I, I was uh, moving there with, with my partner, who's a transgender guy, and um, we had started dating before he had started medically transitioning. So during this trip, it was the first time that people on the street, I think, started to perceive him as, as male, perceive him as being a guy. And so it was the first time that me walking down, with this street, down the street with this person um, was perceived differently than it had been before. You know, mm-hmm. I think it was the first time that like, I was perceived as a gay man. Um, so that was something that I was noticing. You know, we were suddenly leaving this place we'd lived for three years together in Florida, coming to a totally new place where no one saw, uh, no one knew us. And I suddenly realized that people were seeing me differently. And within a week of moving into this apartment building, I had this really, you know, kind of traumatic experience where one of my neighbors in the apartment building at first uh, became kind of strangely fascinated with me. He was really intent on knowing my name. He was always in the hall when I was in the hall. It was a little hard to figure out what was going on with with this guy. And then within a week of moving in, suddenly there was this episode where we, we came home from um, seeing a movie and suddenly we heard someone yelling my name. It was kind of surreal. Like I just moved to the city. I didn't know anyone there. It was hard to figure out what was going on. Um, and then he started you know, kind of like yelling out these homophobic slurs and yelling out these violent threats. And suddenly I realized that's the guy in my apartment building, the one guy who knows my name in this whole city. Right? Wow. So it was this horrifying experience. Uh, I ended up moving out of that apartment. Uh, the rental company you know, let us move into another apartment just up the block. Um, but processing that experience, it seemed uh, you know, really important for me to kind of stick to my own experience. And there was also something I felt like I had to kind of articulate to myself mm-hmm. at that time. I was kind of uh, suddenly realizing the extent to which my identity had shifted through this relationship and the way I was being perceived. And so I had a lot to kind of think about in writing as a way that I like to think through those things. Um, so, you know, that's on the far end of something that was just drawn directly from life. Like, here's something that happened to me that was, you know, both dramatic and also kind of important for me to process. And so I did that through writing. Yeah, I mean, it, it really, writing plays two functions there. It's it's your career, but it's also a way to process certain instances, especially something as traumatic as that, to try to f- figure out your feelings toward it and, and work through it. I mean, it's definitely something that... Uh, takes a lot to, to think about and process. And, Absolutely, yeah. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, writing, I, I think writing is powerful in a lot of ways and, you know, not only to tell a story, but also to really think about your own experiences, whether it be the disturbance or mm-hmm. whether it be something like that. It's mm-hmm. like, you know, how can I make sense of this in, mm-hmm. in a lot of ways? Absolutely, yeah. I think that's one of the big reasons that we tell stories is to process things, right? To try to understand them better. Yeah, I'm teaching. Um, I'm teaching a class on short stories right yeah, now, yeah. and, and we're, that was one of the first questions that I asked my class: is like, why do we tell stories? Why are we so attracted to stories? Whether it be in school stories that you read, or at the lunch table, people telling you stories, or stories that you kind of think about on your own, or even like a Netflix show. It's a story. Like, why do humans gravitate so much towards story writing? And I think that's part of the answer: is to make sense of reality make sense of life. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I start my creative writing class with that question every time because uh, I think it, it's important for um, students who are, you know, just kind of beginning to to try to figure out how to write stories, whether they're fictional or non-fictional, to recognize that we all know how to tell stories, right? We, we do this as, as people. We do it in our everyday lives. It's a different thing to try to figure out how to do that in writing, you know, to try to figure out how to make it up instead of, you know, telling something that really happened. But I think, um, you know, those impulses that we have to tell stories to each other and the the way that we've learned to, you know, set up the context for a story and, uh, you know, tell the story in the most interesting or amusing or entertaining way, like those, those are natural skills that people have, and, and I think it's important to tap into that um, when, when you're writing stories as well. I think one one of the not traps, but one of the things that people anticipate when they're either telling a story or trying to write a story is that they need to convey a, a sense of meaning or like a, a moral at the end of mm-hmm. it. When that's not always the case, I mean, 
for me and just my experience in studying English and teaching these courses, it's it's really more about the questions that are raised and the conversations that stories can uh, raise for people in a community or for the individual. Like when I read your story, the disturbance, I didn't I didn't have anyone to really discuss it with, but mm-hmm. it's it still brought up questions for me in my head to think about, and I think that that is more so the power of a story than a certain moral or like a way to live your life, like a guideline. Um, And I think that for my students, sometimes they kind of fall into like, this author's trying to tell me to live my life this way, when really it's just for you to think about certain questions maybe. Absolutely. And I think what's really powerful about stories is that they allow you um, to have an experience that you haven't actually had or to feel like you have an experience, you know, to experience something from someone else's perspective uh, to experience something that maybe didn't even really happen, but that someone imagined. And um, I think that's really different from, you know, making an argument. If I'm writing a persuasive essay with a, you know, particular message that I want to convey, you know, I think that's a totally valid form of writing, you know, uh, you know, similarly like philosophy. Like, there are ways to ad- address these questions, to make arguments, to, to uh, express ideas about the way that one should live or about certain, you know, kind of ethical questions and that kind of thing. Um, and, and I agree. I think if a story uh, seems too laser focused on that, it's, it's slightly missing what's unique about it as a genre, which is mm-hmm. that it can allow you to, to sit with something that m- might not be totally resolved or resolvable, to sit, kind of sit in that complexity and, and feel something, right, mm-hmm. rather than simply coming to a conclusion. So as a writer yourself, do you, like when you sit down to write a story or you have that idea that's germinating in your head, that's maybe something that happened to you mm-hmm. and you're, mm-hmm. you're trying to find a certain meaning or moral are you thinking about the the ending in that way or are you kind of just like playing out that sequence of events um, as a storyteller without maybe so much of a moral or like a underlying meaning as you're writing it I mean I think uh, I think a lot about the questions that you know, the stories that I'm working on raise. I think a lot about ideas. I think my characters think a lot about ideas. My characters have ideas because people do. I think that's part of how we process the world. You know, so I don't think it's something you totally have to excise from fiction. Um, I think what I try to avoid is uh, setting the story up as if it's like a puzzle to solve. You know, like as if if someone reads the story correctly, they will come to this one, you know, like very definite conclusion and they will have, you know, solved the story and and that's it. I think the most powerful work is something that kind of remains unresolvable at the end. It raises the right questions. It puts you in in this experience. The characters might have ideas. There might be different characters in the story that have conflicting ideas and they might both be right in their different ways and you can kind of kind of sit with that uh, that kind of ambiguity and that tension. Um, And so yeah I I definitely don't have uh, I I would say like a message that I'm trying to get across but you know I, I also wouldn't say that that I shy away from asking questions and exploring ideas and uh, having characters with opinions or having you know characters with ideas for like sure. that. Yeah, for sure. I, th- I think one of my um, favorite quotes is E. L. Doctorow is like your writing is like driving a car at night and it's like you can't really see the destination, but you're operating in the fog and the darkness and you're going to get there. Uh, it's something along those lines, and I think. Just from what I know about writing, that that is somewhat true. Would you say like you're you don't know what the destination is, but you're you're trying to get somewhere, and you should kind of just trust that you're gonna find a resolution at the end, maybe. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, something about like you only have to see ten feet in front of you at a time, right? But that can take you all the way there. Yep. I think that's true, and I think that if you have a too definite idea of how the story is going to end too soon, then that can kind of close off possibilities. The other thing that I think is really powerful about revision is that it gives you a chance to not settle for the first thing that occurs to you. You know, you can have a second or a third or a fourth or a fifth idea. And I think, um, and you can do this over a long span of time, right? Like, so if I were to just make up a story off the top of my head right now, I might be able to tell a decent story. But then if immediately after I was to try, try to tell it again, um, I, I would have a better sense of where I was going, right? Mm-hmm. And I could kind of shift things accordingly. But I think endings are especially, you know, can be difficult to stay open to, to, to possibly changing. Um, but yeah, another way of putting that is uh, no surprise for the writer, no surprise for the reader, right? You want to leave your, yourself open to the possibility of being surprised. Um, leave yourself open to the unexpected if you want the work to feel alive and, and, and surprising on the page. That's part, part of the fun of it, right? Is Absolutely. that you don't know where it's going. Yeah, it's... yeah. 
it's like reading very, very slowly. It's yeah. like kind of this, you know, when it's, when it's going really well, that's what it feels like to me. It's that same sort of process of discovery, of being surprised by, by what's about to happen, even as you're, you're writing it. So maybe we could talk a little bit about revision, because that's something that in my classes I'm trying to convey to my students the importance of what, what you're going to write for your first draft is not going to be very good. Mm -hmm. Like you have to spend time going back over it, changing things, making alterations, deleting parts, mm -hmm. right? The word count is, is often a struggle for, for my students at least. And I tell them, like, I tell them, guys, when I send an email to you, do you know how many times I read it, like reread it? Mm -hmm. Probably four or five times. And mm -hmm. it's, you know, I could have a typo in there, but that's just part of my habits as like who I am as kind of a writer and a reader type literary person mm -hmm. is rereading is so important. So maybe you could talk a little bit about the revision process for you and your writing. Yeah. So I think that was probably the single most important, you know, piece of feedback I ever got was in my undergrad creative writing class. At the very end of the semester, we had revisions due and I had a one-on-one -on -one conference with the prof um, who basically just said, you know, you haven't really revised these. And that's the first time I understood what revision really meant because, you know, like... Um, Writing's always been, you know, a favorite subject of mine. It's something I have a kind of natural facility for. And I think that for a long time kind of helped me squeak by. You know, we'd do peer reviews in class and I'd have a few little things to fix and I'd fix those few little things and I'd turn in the paper and get an A. So I, I kept, for a long time, I kind of thought that's what revision was, that it was tweaking, that it was proofreading. And this was the first time that I realized, oh no, he means something radically different by revision than what I think rewriting is. And it was kind of the best news and the worst news that I'd ever gotten about writing. Um, the worst news, because it was going to be a lot more work than I thought it was going to be. But the best news, because suddenly it seemed possible, right? I didn't have to be this, like, um, amazing genius who would just sit down and write something absolutely brilliant and dazzling on the first try, right? That's not who a writer is. All I had to do was get something down and be willing to reconsider it, try it another way, try it another way, try it another way, um, until it starts to approach that, right? So if you can do it one sentence at a time, um, George Saunders has a great essay about this. You can end up sounding a lot smarter um, and uh, you know funnier and more entertaining and wise than you actually are because you, you've you've had the time to, um, to consider you know kind of every sentence, every every plot turn in the story. Um, you can do it a lot more slowly than than you can usually process or or you know kind of think about things in real life. Is that a frustrating process for you, though, knowing that whatever it is you write, you're going to have to spend so much time rereading it, restructuring, recrafting the whole thing at the end? Or is it more of a fulfilling experience for you as a writer? Uh, yeah, I would say yes and no. And my process has changed a little bit over time. I think early on, um, when I was still figuring out you know, how to even write a first draft, revision was even more important and I approached it much more kind of like ruthlessly and, and radically. Like I would literally like go to save as, um, save a new copy of the document, delete everything and just start typing again. Sometimes I'd have like the printed out manuscript next to it so I could choose to either retype a sentence or not, right? Mm -hmm. Like have, I think one of the things that's tricky with word processing is it just, it's there. It seems like it it has to be there. It seems kind of inevitable that the words you've chosen are the words that are the story. Yeah. Um, but if you can, if you make yourself actually physically retype every sentence, then you actually have to make an active decision to keep that sentence or to, or to cut it or to change it in some way or to write something else, right? Hmm. So that was really helpful for me. Um, now I think I have like a slightly more um, like on the fly process. Um, I think I've gotten a little bit better about getting closer to where I want to be to start with, you know, start with, you know, after doing it for 10 years, I think I just have gotten a little bit better at first draft, so that helps. Um, but also, I think I've learned to not let myself get too far before kind of doubling back and thinking about different ways to try something. Like a story I was working on last fall, um, I maybe did, you know, five or six different versions of the opening just to see how many different ways it could go, try to hone in on a voice and a tone that I thought was really interesting before I moved on, you know, mm -hmm. just so that I wouldn't get to that problem of getting to the end of a draft and needing to delete everything. Um, so, so that's kind of how my approach to that's changed a little bit. Interesting. Is it is it harder for you to begin a story? Like, a, is it harder for you to find the voice that you think is most fitting for the beginning, or is it harder to conclude a story? Do you think? I think probably for me, the the beginning is is the harder part. Really? And, you know, ending can be 
difficult. What, what goes into the decisions at the beginning of a story? I mean, you have to think of the narrative point of view. You have to think of the first sentence, right? I mean, what what are you thinking about in that process? For, for me, I really have to have some idea of what the story is about before I can start. I know there are some writers who just like start with a sentence, start with an image, maybe start with a, you know, a character or something, um, and, and then kind of figure out where it goes. Um, I, I get really stuck if I don't have some basic concept of like, okay, this is the basic big picture idea of what the story is about. I don't know how it's going to end. I don't know what some of the complications along the way will be. But like, basically, um, what I want to start with is an inciting incident, like the the initial thing that gets the plot moving, mm -hmm. right? And then where the plot goes from there, I want to keep some surprises for myself. But if I don't kind of know, like, what's the occasion for the story? Why is today different from any other day? You know, like. What, what's going to get us started here, um, then, then I have a really hard time getting started. I mean, that's not to say that, like, ending is easy, especially with something longer. I'm working right now on a novel project that's the third one I've started, and if I finish it, will be the first one I've finished, you know? So, like, I think the longer it gets, the harder it gets to end, you know? Th mm -hmm. that, that's really where the, the challenge comes in then. So you, you started your career working mostly on short stories, mm -hmm. and now you're getting more into writing larger works, novels. Yeah, and as kind of training wheels in between the two, I worked on a few novellas that ended up being my um, my dissertation project at, at the for the PhD program at Cincinnati. And one of those I've kept as a novella. I think it, it works at that length. Um, that's going to be coming out in Subtropics, the um, the lit journal at the University of Florida, sometime in the near future. I'm not sure exactly when. Great. Um, Congratulations. Thanks. Thanks. Awesome. Um, another one I cut down to kind of a long story, maybe like a 30 or 40 page story. It turned out it didn't quite need to be a full novella. And then the other one I've scrapped for now, maybe I'll come back to it at some point. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a really different form, the short story and the novel. I think, you know, like one's a sprint, one's a marathon. I think the, um, I don't uh, usually like to outline and I think it's really hard to get to the end of a novel without having some sort of plan. It's just such an intricate construction and I've had some amazing teachers who have been really able to kind of like lay that out for me like how a novel generally works what the three acts are you know like what, what needs to happen when um how you tie together you know different subplots into kind of one master plot you know um but it's 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 hard it's and it's not as natural to me as writing sh short stories so it's something that I'm still learning how to do it's interesting because the way I describe short stories for the course I'm teaching is this is in some ways harder than writing a novel to write a short story because it's so compact and you have to fit all of those themes, ideas, expressions into such a short uh, form, such a shortened, abbreviated form. But it sounds like, the, I mean, for you, it seems like the novel is more difficult, it's just more intricate maybe. I think it really depends on the writer too. Like some some of my, my profs um, at, at Florida and Cincinnati are like master novel writers. They get how the novel works. It's just intuitive to them. They learn how to do it and that's what they can do. And they, they don't really write short stories, right? Like, um, and then other, other writers who are kind of the other way around um, so yeah, they, they, they have really different challenges. Um, and that's certainly not to say that the story is easy, right? Like I think exactly what you pointed out is right. The, the difficulty of, um, of, of working in such a compact form and still telling a story that feels whole. Um, and I think that for people who have mostly read novels, you know, whether for pleasure or in school and have mostly seen movies or like extended TV series, like the short story is kind of in an unfamiliar form, right? Mm -hmm. It'd be like trying to uh, you know, make a short film instead of making a, a feature. And um, it's hard to, when you're starting out, to figure out how to get the pacing right. It's hard to um, recognize how close to the end you have to start, you know, mm -hmm. to be able to get all the way to the end. Um, and so, yeah, I think especially, you know, in early drafts, you do see a lot of stuff in workshops that feels like the beginning to a novel rather than a short story. If you were teaching this great short fiction course that I'm just getting started now. I'm in, I guess, the second week. I have a great group of students. I actually have three girls from, from China in the class, and they're Zooming in from, from China since they went home from Bryn Mawr and Roland Park. Mm -hmm. So I have a good crew in there. But um, if you were um, teaching a great short fiction class, are, are there any authors or stories that stick out to you that you would want to go through? Yeah, I mean, I think... Uh trying to cover it all in one semester is probably impossible so, it's yeah. so hard. <laughs> yeah that was the hardest part for me was choosing what to what to put in here you yeah know? i mean yeah. I, i'm going in a chronological order but i'm missing so many great short stories obviously there's yeah. just not enough time 
Um, I mean, for me, the like the short story writers that I keep coming back to um, and that I feel like I've learned the most from uh, are probably um, Flannery O'Connor, Anton Chekhov, um, for sure, uh, Grace Paley. Um, though I wouldn't say that I've learned from her, really. I think she's like impossible to learn from. She's just too original. But I think in terms of just kind of showing me something about what's possible with the story, um, like she's been really important for me. Um, in my creative writing class, I focus mainly on contemporary short fiction, uh, which gives a little bit less of, you know, like the history of the form. But I think for people who are trying to write short stories like right now or like three weeks from now, it, you know, for this class and they're going to have to turn it in, I think it's really helpful to see how people are using contemporary language to tell stories, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, contemporary themes, concerns, settings, characters, you know, people whose, whose lives might be a little more recognizable to them. Mm -hmm. um, so just this week, uh, in, uh, just today, we were discussing a short story by Zizi Packer, who I think is amazing, another one by Leslie Neka Arima, who writes kind of speculative fiction, so those stories are really different. Um, there's a story by Adam Hazlitt that I always teach called City Visit. Um, there's a, a story by A.L. Major that I really love called Antonia's Baby Shower on Camperdown Road. Um, it, it, it was in a lit journal. I don't think she's published a book yet, but it's, it's a story that just absolutely like breaks my heart every time and it's so short and it, and it does so much in its span of 10 pages um john cheever's reunion is often what i start with that's you know, a story that when it was first appeared in the new yorker it was one page of mm -hmm. the magazine it's it's so compact and um yet there's so much in it so i think um you know that's a fun one to really drill down into in close read in, in a super short story like that, like a one-page story, what are some of the aspects of it that you try to point out to your students who are going to write their own yeah. short stories? I think a really interesting thing about that story is what it illustrates about the balance of showing and telling in, in fiction. And I think that a lot of writers have heard the advice, show, don't tell, right? That's something that is, is like considered to be common knowledge. And I think that's good advice to a certain extent, right? If you can help your reader, um, you know, kind of like feel like they're actually experiencing this world through their senses rather than just, you know, describing it through very abstract terms, you're going to immerse them in the story more. Absolutely true. At the same time, like compared to film and television, um, fiction really gives you a lot of leeway to just tell your reader things. Mm -hmm. And I think that one of the things that's really interesting about the way that story is constructed is that it's got a long first paragraph that has tons of telling in it. It just tells you absolutely everything you need to know. So this kid, this kid Charlie, is meeting up with his dad at Grand Central Station. The parents are divorced. He's on his way from one place to another. He's between trains. The dad's going to meet up with him for lunch. Uh, he's got an hour for lunch. We learned that he, the kid wrote to his dad to ask if he would meet up from meet up with him for lunch, but that the, the dad's secretary wrote back rather than the dad himself. There are all these little telling details. And maybe most crucially, we learn how important this visit is to this kid. This kid hasn't give up, given up on this dad yet. He, he really wants to have a relationship with him. He really admires him and thinks a lot of him. Um, and so we're told all of that just, you know, just straight out as, as plain spokenly as possible in the first paragraph. And then the rest of the story is almost entirely showing. We go through these scenes where they're going from one restaurant to the other. The dad keeps trying to order cocktails for himself and for his 16 year old son, which is, you know, like wildly inappropriate in and of itself. But he also just like keeps like heckling the, uh, the waiters and getting kicked out of these restaurants because he's just being such a jerk. Um, and then at the very end of the story, it repeats what was the very first line of the story, which was that was the last time I saw my father. And so suddenly, you know, kind of the weight of this, this meeting is, is made so apparent. Um, and I, I just think it's so artful how he does that, how he tells us everything we need, we need to know. And then from there, he doesn't have to tell us a single thing because we can just watch these events unfold and we know exactly what that narrator's emotional experience is, even if he never says, I felt sad or I felt alienated by my dad. You know, he never has to declare it. We, we just like, we know what this meant to him. We see how it went. And at the end, you know, um, it's, the, he ends the story with this kind of run-on sentence, almost like he's rushing to get to the end, almost like he, you know, he, he can't talk about this any longer, you know. Um, and so I think the narration in the story is really amazing as well. Yeah, it's, I mean, the show don't tell is such common advice, and that's something that I was teaching my first and second year really in my English classes because my students do a personal essay unit. They write about themselves and trying to convey that you, you want it use language that your reader can visualize and sense and smell and mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. understand is important but i've i've gone away from that because you can weed out some of the almost unimportant details of things like in that first 
paragraph of the story you're referring to mm-hmm. by just telling, here's what's going on, here's the background, now let's get to like the more important relationship aspect of the father and son at the, at the restaurants and everything that that maybe reveals more. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I don't think that piece of advice is wrong on its own terms, but I do think there's a danger of, of kind of overlearning it. Like if, if Cheever thought that instead of telling us that this guy is his dad, he had to show that somehow and was, you know, um, there are all these like convoluted ways that you feel like you have to write if you don't know that you can just forthrightly tell your reader something. That was another like piece of feedback that I got um, in one of those loft literary center classes that seems so obvious in retrospect, but was something I needed to be told, which was, I'm not sure whether this character is like his wife, his sister, his girlfriend, why don't you just tell us? And I thought, oh, I can just tell you, that's so easy, you know? Right. And then I can go on from there. We, I mean, we don't have to waste time speculating, right? Don't need to overthink it. You exactly. just state it outright. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, and, that, that loft in Minnesota, it sounds like that was your first really writing experience. Seems like you learned and took a lot from that. Yeah, it's a great place. Yeah. Um, so how about Cheever? You, you said that Cheever, or I'm um, sorry, not Cheever, uh, Chekhov has made an impact on you as a writer because he, he is one of the writers who I'm teaching in the short fiction class. Yeah. And what, what has he, um, what type of impact has his stories, which are amazing by the way, mm-hmm. what have they m- made upon you? So, uh, I think one thing that he kind of opened up for me is the possibilities of third person. Um, most, if not all of the stories I've read by him are mm-hmm. in third person, right? Um, and so uh, he has this like seemingly completely objective sort of neutral you know, view uh, for the most part. Um, and yet we learn so much about how these characters think, how they perceive the world. And that, that like little sliver of distance between this narrator who's telling us about this character and what's going on inside the character's mind, I think really helps kind of distinguish the characters from the writer. So we're, and his characters are really pretty wildly different in terms of the way that they think about the world, the way that they think about themselves, the way that they perceive things. Um, and so uh, he, he was uh, you know, famously like also a doctor, he was a physician. Um, and so he does have this kind of like almost clinical but also very human way of uh, taking each of these stories as a sort of little like test case of like different ways that humanity can be that I think is really fascinating. Yeah, he's he's amazing. Um, and his stories stories are a lot of them are so short too. I mean, mm-hmm. it's I just admire the short story craft that you can put so much of meaning and and questions about human nature into such a short um, form, mm-hmm. like he does, like Cheever does, like a lot of these writers do in the short story unit that I'm teaching and, and learning about right now. Mm-hmm. It's, pretty amazing. The other thing that I think is interesting about him is like he's you know kind of um, you know considered rightly like a master of realism he's you know kind of like a straightforward um, you know objective uh, third person narrator kind of writer Um, and he is that but he also breaks so many rules and he gets away with it so well. Um, Francine Prose has a great chapter about that in her book Reading Like a Writer just pointing out all the times that he violates what's you know, kind of conventional wisdom about what's supposed to work or not in fiction. Like, can you have your viewpoint character just suddenly die before the end of the story? You're not supposed to be able to do that, but he does it, you know, and, and, he, and he does it brilliantly. There's a, there's always a reason that he breaks these rules, and there's always so much purpose that he does it with. And it's, it's really just kind of a fascinating way to challenge conventional wisdom that you might have, you know, learned in an intro creative writing class. Yeah, um, that's something that I'm trying to... And, and another text that I'm teaching is the things they carried. And I was mm-hmm. talking about mm-hmm. today how, like, we were pointing out as we were reading one of the stories how it's not proper English, a lot of it. And mm-hmm. this, a lot of them are sentence fragments. And, you know, if this was a analytical paper that you were turning into me, I would, I would be crossing things out and telling mm-hmm. you that this is improper. But in a form like the short story or once you've kind of mastered this type of art form, you can break those rules, which is... It's hard to conv- it's hard to balance the two, right? Like when you're teaching, here are the rules, here are the parameters for you guys as you're as you're learning this. But once you master them, once you understand what you're doing, you can you can totally disregard them. It's, yeah. it's, it, it's so weird. And there's I think there's a connection between the two things. One of my professors at Florida is this writer named Paget Powell, who's written some of just the most absolutely bizarre fiction that I've ever read. Just just experimental, strange, completely off the wall, really funny, really strange. And in his workshop class, he would always teach, uh, he'd have us buy this huge volume of William Trevor stories, an Irish short story writer who's amazing, but super straightforward, just like super conventional 
uh, very realistic. We would read a lot of his stories and a couple of Flannery O'Connor stories and maybe a couple of Donald Barthelme stories, which are more in line with what Paget was doing. But that's kind of when I realized that, oh, the reason that Paget can do what he does and you know kind of break all these rules and do all of, all of this crazy experimental stuff is uh, is he you know knows so well what those rules are mm-hmm. and and has great respect actually for writers who work within them. Yeah, I mean, it, rem- it always reminds me of Picasso. Like if Picasso mm. was a master at the human figure in in painting when he was 10 years old but you see his stuff when he's 50 and 55 60 years old and it just looks nothing like what it what it should look like mm-hmm. but he's well aware of that he's breaking all of these rules because he's mastered the craft mm-hmm. uh, it's very similar i like to try to make those art comparisons because it's it's striking visually to see this is Picasso did this when he was 10 years old. It's amazing. The proportions are perfect. The human body is, there's nothing wrong with it. This is what he did when he was 55. And it's, mm-hmm. you know, cubism and everything's skewed and off. It's, it's very similar to, I think, this writing idea that we're talking about. Absolutely. So Flannery O'Connor, you said that she is one of your influences too. What, what do you like about her? Um, so she can be so mean. And it kind of took me a minute to catch on to that. But um, I, th- I think she's absolutely hilarious. Um, I, I, I was raised Catholic, um, and uh, she's famously a Catholic writer. So that was kind of when I first encountered her was, you know, reading a lot of her really kind of like theologically grounded work. Um, and so I kind of always had this perception of her as, as a, a writer who was, uh, you know, in some ways, um, you know, like kind of, kind of safe or, or moral. And she is that. She's profoundly that. Um, but she also just is amazing, I think, at uh, kind of skewering these these characters that she writes about. Um, and she does that through third person too, but but by just laying out the character's own thoughts, like, you know, just, and uh, po- not even pointing out, but simply putting on display for us the kind of contradictions that these, you know, kind of like backward Southern characters of her have. At the same time, I think she does have like a real generosity for her characters. She had this idea that uh, her stories, if, if not all of them, most of them end in this kind of moment of grace where these characters who she spent a lot of the story making look, you know, faintly ridiculous, um, like have this real moment of kind of realization of kind of moving outside themselves. Often it's accompanied with some really violent climax, right? Mm-hmm. Like at the end of A Good Man is Hard to Find or at the end of Greenleaf. Um, but there's just, uh, she's such a brave writer. I think um, another thing that um, the professor I've mentioned just a moment before, Paget Powell pointed out, about her stories is that she never um, she never holds back from a dramatic ending, right? Mm-hmm. You know, the the story Green Life, Green Leaf, which ends with the central character Mrs. May getting gored by this bull. He was saying, you know, a contemporary contemporary writer might end this story with Mrs. May and the bull kind of staring at each other in a you know kind of more ambiguous muted ending. Flannery O'Connor's not going to do that, right? Like if if the the bull is facing down Mrs. May, they've been you know kind of circling each other this whole story. He, uh, she's going to push the way all all the way through to that inevitable ending. Hmm. It's interesting that you enjoy that because I feel like before you were talking about in your own writing, you want some kind of ambiguity at the end and and questions raised, but it doesn't sound too much like Flannery O'Connor. For, and from what I've read of hers, she's very overt with her endings and her resolutions. Yeah, I think that's true. You know, one of the things that I love about fiction is it can be so many different things. That so there, there are so many writers that I like for so many different reasons. And I think if if someone gets to a level where they can do what they do with you know the kind of um, like virtuosity and and um, you know talent that she does, um, it's at the end of the day maybe less for me about what the project is than how well it's carried off and. I, I certainly wouldn't want to live in a world where every story was a Flannery O'Connor story or mm-hmm. every writer was Flannery O'Connor, but I'm so glad she's one of them, right? Like, she's just so distinctive, so completely herself. Every writer has their own style, and, and however that style works, if it works, it works, right? If you like the story, that's all that really matters. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I don't think that you have to, you know, um, necessarily even feel the same way as the writer does or have the same view of the world. Just to be presented with a view of the world that's radically different from your own, I think is one of the the really exciting things about fiction. Excellent. Um, so Ryan, um, the other thing that I think we should get to today is the the Writers at Work series that you do here, and maybe some of the other things that you do on campus in addition to teaching your creative writing course and you know writing on your own. What what else do you do here at Gilman? Yeah. So. Um, Writers at Work has been really 
fun for me. Um, the so the Tickner Fellow always um, is in charge of ultimately deciding who to invite. You know, I often consult with other colleagues in the English department about that. Um, but we have uh, three or four writers a year come visit campus. Um, they'll usually come to my creative writing class in the morning and give some kind of master class. Um, they'll give a reading during the afternoon assemblies, which most people you know have probably been to. Um, of course, we're doing that a little bit differently this year with everything on Zoom. Um, and one thing that's been really uh, a kind of silver lining about that is we've added um, this aspect where we have an optional Q&A following the reading, um, where instead of doing the webinar format, we just have an open Zoom meeting. You know, everyone's free to jump in and talk, ask questions. It's a little more informal. Um, and I think th those have been really fun with um, with both Marcus Wicker, the poet who most recently visited. That was great. And uh, Joe Sacksetter, a fiction writer before him. We had some, some really fun conversations. Um, that, that students were able to actively participate in. So th that, that's been really cool. Yeah, it's awesome for the students to get their questions out there because I know I personally had a lot of questions for you as, as a writer, and I constantly have questions about how you go about what you do. I mean, I, I think every writer goes about things differently, but mm -hmm. for me, who's, who's someone who writes on my own a little bit, it's always it's such a difficult, daunting task to write something. Um, and I'm always curious about how other writers go about their process. For sure. Um, so great. So we have writers at work, and um, you also work a little bit with the Paragon magazine too. So maybe we can talk about that. Yeah. And, and just for students who might be interested in that, maybe younger students, mm -hmm. uh, how to get involved with Paragon because I'm I'm interested in that, and and you guys do some art in there and some writing and some poetry and it seems like a, a really cool publication here that we have at Gilman. Yeah, that's been super fun. So um, there, there are a couple other faculty advisors on that too. Uh, Mr. Ravel's been doing it for a long time. Um, and then this year, Miss Scott in the library is helping out as well with some of the design stuff. So she's been coming to our meetings, which we're all really excited about. She's got a lot of experience with that. Um, Charlie Nuremberger's our student editor this year and was last year. Uh, th there had been a few years where there had been a gap, I know, when we weren't putting out Paragon anymore. And um, I think a lot of credit goes to Charlie for really bringing it back to life. He's really revived the magazine. Uh, we had a great, uh, relatively small staff last year that put together an issue that was all digital um, because when COVID happened, it, you know, it got challenging to try to print it and everything. But we were able to share that with the community, he got some really nice feedback on it. There was, you know, fiction, poetry, art. Um, I think some creative nonfiction as well. Um, and then we've been, yeah, we've been getting some great submissions this year. Uh, we've got a great student staff with uh, representatives from every grade in the upper school. And absolutely, we'd you know, love to have more people. If anyone even wanted to jump in this year, you know, they could reach out to Charlie or they could reach out to me. Um, and absolutely, you know, uh, as it goes forward uh, next year, as the next, you know, Tickner Fellow is here stepping into my shoes and Mr. Ra Mr. Rowell and Ms. Scott will still be there, you know, um, you know, kind of carrying the torch, and it'll definitely be fun to see how that continues to grow. Awesome. Do you have any plans after you finish up this Tickner Fellowship? Are you going to stick around in Baltimore, or do you have any ideas of what's next for you? That's been a big question this year. Um, and so, uh, you know, when I applied to this fellowship, I was applying to a number of other writing fellowships as well as some, some college teaching jobs because that's really kind of what I trained to do in the MFA and especially the PhD program. Um, COVID, you know, uh, had a big impact on the academic job market, especially in, in higher education. And so there hasn't been much for me to apply for this year. Um, so, you know, that's been a little deflating. It's, it's not great. Um, there are a few things that, you know, I'm going to hear back on. Uh, got, got a lot of applications out there. Um, my partner was actually just accepted for a postdoc at Dartmouth. So oh, wow. if nothing else comes up, um, it seems like we'll probably, you know, be out there. Going up north. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I think the silver lining is for me, um, that might mean some more writing time. If I don't have another full-time gig next year, there would definitely still be some freelance work I could do with, with people I've worked with ever since I had that job in Minneapolis. And um, I'm, I'm really getting into this novel project, and I've started reaching out to some agents. So, you know, there are some balls rolling, and um, if I end up having more downtime than I planned on next year, I think I'll f find some good ways to use it. Um, outside of the job hunt for you, is the writing process and, and what you're doing um, on your own, has that been impacted by COVID, or has that been kind of a blessing almost for you to have some time to, to write more and honestly be on your own writing honestly it's it's had a bit of an impact i think just on you know just kind of an emotional level and in, in terms of the energy that i feel i have to put towards writing it it felt like a setback and it you know 
uh, on paper, there's no reason that should be the case. I had more time at home. Um, but just uh, in terms of headspace, you know, I just, for a lot of uh, the beginning of this year and last year, didn't feel like I was entirely there. Um, but I'm really feeling that that shifting now. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm really uh, picking up some momentum. Um, I've been in touch with one of my old advisors who put me in touch with a couple agents um, and, you know, haven't heard anything definitive back about that, but I've got a whole short story collection that's ready to go that they'll be looking at. Um, they're interested in this novel idea that I'm working on too. So it, it, it really feels like I, you know, I've got kind of got um, something to work towards now again. And, and so I'm, I'm definitely picking up some momentum and that feels good. That's awesome. Energy's picking back up. Yep. Um, best of luck with your projects, your, your work that you're doing. That's awesome. Thank you. Um, do want to get to the book that you brought in today. I'm interested. I don't know Grace Paley very yeah, well, yeah. but um, why did you choose this book? And if you could hold it up to the camera, that'd be yeah, awesome. Yeah, absolutely. So this is the collected stories of Grace Paley. Um, she's a writer that I didn't encounter until I was in that MFA program in Florida. And um, my uh, one of my professors there, uh, David Levitt, in our forms class my third year, um, or, or, this might have been a workshop. It doesn't matter. He, he had us read three writers, Chekhov, Cheever, and Grace Paley. Um, which is a kind of an interesting pairing, Chekhov and Cheever being much more, uh, you know, kind of grounded in, in more sort of conventional realism. Grace Paley's also a realist, but she's also uh, just a, such a stylist. Mm-hmm. Like, she's a, a sentence writer, first and foremost, a sentence and paragraph writer. And I, ju- I just never read anything quite like this. I think I'd read things that were influenced by it that I liked and I didn't know where they came from. Um, but more than anything, like, she's, she's a voice. Uh, she, she was... Um, she grew up in New York in a, I think, a, a Russian Jewish immigrant family, and you can just, you know, you can kind of hear the Yiddish inflections in the work. You can hear the, the kind of chatty New Yorkiness of the voice. Um, she's absolutely hilarious, and just sentence to sentence, I never know where she's going. She's just always surprising me on the sentence level, um, and she's just like kind of a contradiction in a lot of ways. Like she uh, writes a, a lot about being a mom, and you know what is typically thought of as the province of domestic fiction, but she was also, uh, you know, like a super active anti-war activist and is writing about that as well. Um, She's also like on the style level, totally experimental, even though she's writing about, you know, these kind of conventional domestic uh, sort of stories. And um, yeah, I just, I just, you know, there's nothing else like her. I just, I hear her voice and I want to keep listening to it. It it takes a couple stories to get into, I think, to kind of like, Get, get a handle on the voice and kind of understand who's talking to you and where it's coming from. And but then, yeah, when, once I got into it, I just, I just couldn't get enough of it. You talking about her as a contradictory voice reminds me of I, I think it was you who told me once um, when you're writing, you want to pair something with something that's completely contradictory or mm-hmm. different, and and the fusion of two things that shouldn't go together make for a good story. And it sounds like, you know, Grace Paley might be like this in real life, but she definitely infuses that type of uh, contradiction in her, in her writing too, maybe. Yeah, I think maybe what we were talking about is angular tone. Um, there's this great essay by Tony Hoagland that I always uh, teach in my classes about um, about tone and specifically a tone where one thing's at an angle to another, a, you know, a, a speaker of a poem or a narrator of a story has mm-hmm. a surprising attitude uh, towards what they're talking about. And he actually qu- quotes Grace Paley in that. Oh, essay. yeah. 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 So she's a great example of that. And um, I think just also just like as as a person, I find her inspiring. She she once said, uh, there's more to life than just writing. <laughs> you know, she wrote three collections of stories uh, over a really long career. Um, you know, maybe a couple books of poems that are collected in a single volume just like this. And, you know, like lived a life and raised her kids and did her activism and did what she thought was important. And um, she's just so completely unpretentious and uh, so completely charming and so completely real. Down to earth. Yeah, yeah. Love it. Yeah. Great. So I'll definitely check her out and, and maybe use some of her stories in, in my class. Yeah, I could definitely recommend some if, if you're That'd interested. Be, that would be awesome. Um, the last question. So Path to Fall podcast, this is the 29th episode and got a long list of, of people from Gilman that I'd like to have on. Is there anyone that sticks out to you that if you were the podcast host you would have on, you'd like to maybe hear a little bit more from, mm, that's from a, Gilman? That's a great question. Um, I mean, that's, that's actually Ann Stusen. I have to give her a shout out because she, uh, I'm getting some, some advice on the podcast, which I love. Any feedback is great. But. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, have you had Ms. Knapp on yet? I have, yeah. Yeah, that was a great okay. episode. I'll have to check out that episode. Episode eight, maybe. Okay, that was a good one. Yeah, excellent. What about Mr. Foreman? 
Johnny Foreman, he we need to get him on. We've been yeah. talking about that, so yeah. that that will be coming up. It's a good, it's a good one. Yeah, he's just been at Gilman so long. I'd, yeah, I'd I'd love to hear more from his perspective. Institution of knowledge, yeah, absolutely great. Well, Ryan, it was a pleasure to have you on today. Thanks for uh, for talking about writing, about authors, about your craft, what you do here at Gilman. Um, I thought it was a great episode, so thanks a lot. My pleasure. Thanks for having me.